All right. Okay. So. Okay. So, so I mean, uh, let me uh, introduce you uh, a little bit. Although I forgot to print out your bio, so uh, you may have to help us a little bit about who you are. So I'm David Perlmutter, and welcome everybody to our webinar today: data-driven CRE for the retail recovery with Placer AI and. Uh, we have Ethan Chernofsky, who is a co-founder of Placer AI, with us today. And I've seen their technology, and it's really cool. So you are in for a great experience, uh, undoubtedly. So, uh, Ethan, take it away. Tell us a little bit about Thank yourself. Thank you so much, David. Fill in, fill in the gap. Sure. Sure. So, uh, so my name is, is Ethan. Uh, I'll, I'll keep things to kind of the relevant. You don't have to hear my whole backstory, but I am a, a very much a, a data nerd. Um, I, I love the things that we can, the questions that we can teach ourselves to ask, and then the answers that we can come up with by looking at data. So, uh, prior to Placer, I worked at a company called SimilarWeb, which does online intelligence. And then now am, uh, you know, getting to dive into this world of location data. And essentially, you know, you know, I'll give you, you know, a little bit of, of, of an idea of, of what we do. Um, so, all right. Oh, no. I don't know what I just did. Do you still see my screen or did something just pop up? We still have your I don't screen. Know what I, yeah, but you're seeing my Zoom uh, now as opposed to yeah. what I was showing you before. Like the bottom right where you see the uh, little go to meeting icon on the, in your bar at the bottom. Try that. Yeah. And if that one. Clicking that, that's not good. Okay, and then maybe try the browser. Which browser are you using Chrome? Yeah. Yeah. So click on. There we go. All right. There we go. We should be okay again. All right. Um, there you go. Um, okay. So, uh, so we are placer.ai. If anyone's kind of interested in learning more, please just check it out. Check us out at placer.ai. Uh, everything I'm showing you today is from our premium version, but we do have a free version of our product that you can kind of test out and play with. We also have a free COVID tracker, which analyzes over 150 brands in terms of their daily and weekly traffic year over year and week over week. And then later next week, we're going to be launching uh, a new free tool, which is going to be really exciting. So, you know, if you're interested, please, uh, you know, come with us and see what you know you think of location data and if you want to reach out to me directly i'm at ethan at placer.ai um but a super quick introduction and then we'll we'll dive into the content uh what do we do so at the the highest level location analytics is centered around the idea that uh people vote with their feet and that what it would be really amazing if you could see how the world was voting right so people say that they you know i'll give you a great example from my digital experience you know, there was a time when Facebook uh, had a, this big at Cambridge Analytica scandal, and according to a big market research company, there were, I think, 25% of people were now going to stop using Facebook. Uh, the difference, the change that we saw in terms of, I think 25% of people said they were going to stop using it. The change that we saw was that nothing changed whatsoever. Um, that was a pretty massive difference, you know, from, the, and so well, we really believe in the importance of behavioral data. And so, you know, we think certain things, but what we do is really the most important. So how do we get that information? We start by observing about 30 million devices in the United States. Really critical to, to note that we are GDPR and CCPA compliant. We only look at anonymized data. We are only interested in aggregate anonymous data. So understanding a 30,000 foot level of what's happening. We are not interested in advertising or what an individual is doing in any way, shape, or form. The next thing we do is we analyze that data using AI and machine learning. And we run all these algorithms on top of it so that we can make estimations of the foot traffic for any location in the United States. And then we present that data with a wealth of different reports in our dashboards. So everything from the customer journey where someone was before or after, cross shopping patterns, visit duration, uh, when a visit happened in terms of time of day or day of week, but obviously also visit trends on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis across any location in the United States. And this is just a sampling of some of the different reports we do, trade area analysis, the true trade area analysis, 
uh, market share, routes to take it, take in void analysis, cannibalization, et cetera. And then in terms of an accuracy perspective, we were chosen by MScience as the most accurate location data provider in the US, uh, the most highly correlated with transaction data, which obviously offline visits is incredibly high, highly correlated with, with purchases. So that's a really significant indicator for us. But now on to the stuff that's really exciting, kind of what does the data actually tell us about what's happening in today's retail environment? So the first thing I'm, we're showing here is this is an image from our industry tracker. So we look at a bunch of different industries by state and nationwide, and you're seeing a lot of green. There's a lot of week over week growth in key sectors. And in fact, one of the only areas you're seeing red is home improvement because they had been doing tremendously well. And okay, things are, are moving in the right direction. And that's certainly the case. Every indication we have is that a retail recovery is en route, but, what you're seeing here is that same week's data, not week over week, but year over year. So you're seeing it a lot more red. Things are still down, there's a long way to go, and there's a lot of reasons why. So when we think about states like New York, New Jersey, or California, not really reopening until mid-June, you know, as opposed to many others that had already been opening throughout the beginning and, and later on into May. There are a lot of reasons why these changes are taking place, but it's really important to have the context of one, things are moving in the right direction, but two, we have a long way to go. Another element that kind of shows this is this is actually the true trade area of a mall in South Carolina. And one of the things that's really interesting when you look at this is what you see on the left is the true trade area for the same for the period of early May in 2019. And what you see on the right is the true trade area in early 2020. And in early May 2020. Now obviously it's much smaller. People are coming from much lower distances and a far less, a far lower number of people are coming. And that makes a lot of sense. This is the initial stages of reopening. And it's pretty far away. Yet when we look at that same mall just a few weeks later, we see that it's not all the way there yet, but it's moving closer. And one of the things that's really missing is one, just the, the actual magnitude of visitors, more people coming, but also the distance people are willing to travel. So when you think of a mall, especially, you know, Simon malls were closed, only open from 12 to six on a Sunday. I have three children to convince me to pack three kids into the car, uh, you know, drive 20 to 30 minutes to go to the mall, if not longer. You can do it, but I'm not going to do it if I can't make a day of it. And if I have the limitation on hours, it's going to put a damper on how many people are going to come in at any given time. And so again, the first overall lesson for us is there's a recovery in place, it is happening, there's a lot of confidence to be gained from that. But there are a lot of factors at play beyond just do people wanna go back out? And that is keeping the traffic overall down significantly year over year. But even with the pandemic, something as crazy as, as what we've experienced over the last few months, there are people who actually gained from the situation. And this is really significant. So a great example is the grocery sector. So we look at supermarket shopping over the period from you know, pre-pandemic, there was a massive surge in late February and early March that many of these brands saw monthly visit levels, let alone weekly visit levels, that had surpassed the visits for any period from the time we have data, which starts in 2017. But what's interesting is even when you look at the recoveries, there's two things that are really fascinating. One, how close some of these brands are to being back to normal, if not up year over year. And even more, which brands struggled and which brands are, are much closer to the normal. And the, the differences are really critical here. So one of the things that we've seen is this the return of the traditional grocer. So when you think of a brand like Albertsons or Kroger or Publix, these are the types of supermarkets that when you go there, you know that you can accomplish everything you need within your supermarket, in the bulk of your supermarket list, you can get done in one place. And when you think of the brands that struggle more, whether it's a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods, they don't have that same capacity. At least we don't view them the same way. So if you take like a Trader Joe's, one of the things we found that in the state of Florida, 10% of Trader Joe's visitors will also visit a Publix, the main supermarket chain in Florida, that same day. So not if there's a lot of cross shopping, which you one could expect, but that I go Trader Joe's, I buy the things I want, but I don't consider that my full shop. So then I continue on to Publix afterwards. 
And so that type of phenomenon, that niche component, really put them in a weaker position in the in these last few months. Another brand that struggled a little bit more with Wegmans. But you think for that brand, it's less about what they can provide and much more about where they're located. The bulk of Wegmans stores sit in the Northeast in some of the hardest hit areas with some of the most intense restrictions that have, haven't yet fully opened up. And so obviously you're going to see declines in visits. Now this doesn't acknowledge increases in basket size, it doesn't acknowledge increases in e-commerce, but still really significant indicators, especially for, for an industry that is essentially 95%, if not more, offline. Another really interesting element within this space is not, not just how the visits happen, but what were the changes that we saw in terms of actual consumer behavior? And these were pretty dramatic and interesting and for two reasons. So one thing we compared was Monday through Thursday traffic. And the other thing we looked at was the change in morning traffic. And what you're seeing in both cases on the left, you have the 2019 data, and on the right, you have the 2020 data. Dramatic increases in people visiting supermarkets Monday through Thursday, and dramatic increases in people going to the supermarket in the morning. Now, there's a lot of reasons that one can come up with about why this might take place. But what's really interesting to look at is these changes might actually be very sustainable. So lots of, of, of jobs and companies are saying that they're going to move to more flexible work environments. And then that doesn't mean we're never going to go to the office again. The likelihood of that happening if, in the over, overwhelming majority of cases is incredibly slim. But what could very likely happen is we demand a degree of greater flexibility. And what we're showing with this data is that people don't want to go grocery shopping on the weekend or in the evening, which is when the predominant amount of that shopping takes place in a normal situation. They want to do it in the morning. They want to do it on a Tuesday. And if now I can tell my boss, hey, every Tuesday, I'm going to come in at 10 instead of coming in at 8, and I'm going to get my grocery shopping done, that doesn't just benefit the grocer because I have the time to spend and I'm ready to do it and I'm going to shop throughout the store, not just the, the edges of the store. But it also means that what happens to that hour and a half or two hours that I was spending on the entire grocery experience, quote unquote, just a few months ago? Because driving there, doing the whole shop, getting home, unpacking, that now happened on a Tuesday, which means I have several hours open on a Sunday that I didn't have before, which means I have the ability to go to an apparel retailer or to go do an experiential retail experience somewhere else. So it not only has a significant impact in terms of what the short-term behavioral change could be, but there's also this potential long-term impact that could be incredibly significant. Another trend that we saw, and this was not incredibly surprising, what is surprising is the three brands that we chose for this slide, uh, is that stores like Walmart and Target did extremely well. So when you look at their month-over-month -month visit change, and they, they were obviously considered essential retail, you saw 3% jumps in January, 10% for Walmart and over 10% for Target. And then in March, even though they self-imposed restrictions and many uh, stores were in, uh, states were in lockdown, Walmart only dropped 3.9% in visits and Target dropped only 11%. And then even at the height of the pandemic in April, Walmart dropped less than 20% while Target dropped 32%. And they're already surging back towards normal state. So in May, Target visits were down just 1.6%, while Walmarts were down just 7.2%. We're already seeing Target have days and weeks that are year-over-year -year increases on 2019. And what's amazing, not just about that group, is we included Dix as like a third player in the space. But they're the dominant player within their sector. And as a result, seeing this massive increase in, in visits pre, but also this really incredible speed of recovery. And it's something that's so important to understand as these superstores assert themselves is that they assert themselves in really key areas. So Dix is moving more into sports apparel. What will that mean for Lululemon? What will that mean for Nike? Targets and Walmart, as much as they do compete, they're pretty differentiated in terms of where they aim from a household income perspective as one component, but across many other factors as well. And so this idea that if I'm Target, and I'm Walmart, and I'm in this really strong position, what does that mean for the brands that compete with it? And what does it mean for the brands that might want to partner with it? So, you know, you think of Target relationships with Casper, relationships with Disney and store. 
could we see a greater level of direct-to-consumer companies trying to partner through Target or partner through Walmart? Yes, very likely. Um, and so there's a lot of really interesting elements of that. Another sector that we saw do extremely well during the pandemic was the home improvement sector. During the pandemic led by Lowe's, post-pandemic led by Home Depot. And the slide you're seeing is their estimated visits since January 2019 through this period. So the peaks that you saw weren't just good for the pandemic or good for the year, they were all time levels of, of exceptional performance with the levels of store sizes that they have now. And there's a few reasons for why this brand did so, why this sector did so well. One, it's really well oriented towards a period of economic uncertainty, which is what comes with a pandemic of this proportion. So we, we know we might not have as much money to spend. So instead of using a contractor, we'll do it ourselves. Or instead of, you know, we wanted to upgrade our house and buy a new home entirely, but let's push it off by a year and, and just fix up the kitchen. And even more, we're at home, so we have the time. So a brand like Lowe's, which really orients itself to the do-it-yourselfer, is going to have a really built-in advantage to succeed in this environment, whereas Home Depot benefits from contractors getting back on board and more of these bulk sales. But also regional distribution matters. So Home Depot is one of their largest centers for stores is the state of New York, which was much harder hit than other areas. So clearly they're going to feel that more. But whether this sector considering that they have seen their peak and their peak season was so strong, there could be really long-term benefits to the wider space. Another space that had been doing really poorly pre-pandemic, uh, but you know, at least me think this is actually a really exciting time for the space, is the office supply sector. So if you looked at Office Depot or Staples over the last few years, you've seen near consistent declines in traffic, apart from small pockets of growth in back to school season or elsewhere. And yet, when you look over the last few weeks, they're surging back towards normalcy at a really quick rate. And pre-pandemic, they actually had significantly stronger weeks than they had had in years in the weekends just before the pandemic hit. Why? Because we all need to work from home more. So figuring out how to upgrade that office that we're going to be using from our house is a really significant element. And what's incredible here is that this could potentially provide this unique opportunity for one of these brands to say this is our chance to really turn things around yes we have intense competition from the amazons of the world or even the targets and walmarts but this rise of hey i need my home office to be really well stocked and to, you know to operate effectively we can fill that need develop a relationship and build kind of a brand resurgence around those needs and then finally one of the areas that we're really interested in is where the opportunities may lie and so there's lots of things you can do with the data to kind of uncover these unique pockets where there might be a chance to do something interesting. And the first centers around closure opportunities. So if you think what we're showing on this map is this is an area in California and the blue dot that's kind of blocked a little bit is a pier one. The red, the green, and the yellow are a Lowe's, a Target, and a Bed Bath & Beyond. Now that pier one is closing. And critically, what we're showing you is a five mile ring around the actual location. And then we're showing you the true trade area from a heat map perspective, red high frequency visitors, blue low frequency visitors. And what's really interesting is that essentially what this map is doing is it's giving those other brands a very clear way to target an audience that is going to be quote unquote abandoned by a closing sector. So Pier 1 is seeing a surge in visits right now because of their liquidation sales. But if I'm Target, if I'm Lowe's, if I'm Bed Bath & Beyond, I'm asking where is my overlap Pier 1? And how do I target this audience effectively to be the, the, their new place to buy a certain you know, spectrum of goods? And the locations also give some really critical insights if I'm running a shopping center. So I want to understand how at risk am I with the JC Penny? let's say. Let's say I have a shopping center and it has one of the stores that's closing within it. I wanna look at my rankings feature and understand where does my store fit within the wider landscape? Is there a large degree of cannibalization? Am I operating in a weaker market? Does my market have an opportunity because other brands are closing and therefore I can convince whatever company that is that they should keep the store in my center open? Or at least I have an early sense of what might be closing. 
And then finally, there's this really unique opportunity that's happening with product and direct-to-consumer companies. And it's something we were already seeing in 2019, but it's there's a rare moment in time that this could be happening to a greater extent now. And what we mean by this is companies that were either direct-to-consumer, so think Warby Parkers, Everlanes, and the like, and product companies, so like the Nikes, Lululemons, Pumas of the world that are have, used to have a big wholesale component and are switching to a much more owned you know, relationship with, their, with the consumer, offline and online, though wholesale is still part of the mix for them. And you look at a store like Nike, and they were doing incredibly well in terms of their offline traffic pre-pandemic. And their rate of return is incredibly fast, again, considering how many of their key states are still, still had restrictions at the time this data was polled. And there's this really interesting indication that we could have more of a surge within this space. And what that could create is this really fascinating middle class of retail. So obviously we look at the Targets and the Walmarts and the Best Buys with their massive store footprints and their huge reach. And it's incredibly exciting. But you know, a Target in one place is not necessarily so fundamentally different from a Target in another. But the interesting thing is when you see the removal of more of these chains that have hundreds and hundreds of stores, buy chains that have a smaller number that fill that vacuum, you get a more differentiated retail experience. And something that, you know, I grew up in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and the malls that were near my home were essentially the same thing. They had a Sears, they had a Macy's, they had, you know, an Auntie M's, and they had, you know, it was, it was one half a dozen of the other. But the amazing thing of this influx of new and different types of companies is that you can have mall experiences that are fundamentally different, even if they're in close proximity. And that's something that I think the wider commercial real estate and retail sector should be really excited about because it says that lots of things can live in harmony with each other and don't have to directly compete for the visit. Because it might say to, I might say that I love Nike and I want to go to a Nike store, but I also love, you know, all birds to get my shoes and so I'm going to go to a different mall to go there. So that ability to kind of scatter these brands that can create these unique levels of experience from a shopping center perspective could create something that is far more cohesive and symbiotic as a wider retail landscape. And then finally, I mean, I said finally last time, because <laughs> forgive me, I say finally multiple times. <laughs> um, this, this slide we just labeled food because we had a thesis walking in that, that QSR, that uh, fast food brands were going to do incredibly well. And I think they have, they've been able to mitigate losses through delivery and takeaway. Um, they are re returning incredibly rapidly. They're incredibly popular. When you look at a brand like Popeyes, they're still way up year over year because for whatever reason, that chicken sandwich was so popular, nobody wants to get enough of it. But the interesting thing was we looked, we did analysis of Darden restaurants for a blog that we're only actually releasing next Monday. And we found that even companies like Olive Garden and Longhorn Steakhouse are actually rising to normalcy incredibly quickly. And that was shocking to us because we said, there's no way people want to go sit in a sit down restaurant. There are a few components here. One, some of them really do because they missed it. Two, there's a really strong takeaway element that was built up and strengthened in the pandemic. And in some cases, even a delivery element where one didn't exist before. So it's fascinating to think that pre-pandemic, we would have expected key QSR brands to do very well, but sit down kind of targeting that you know, middle-class restaurant to do incredibly poorly. It actually seems like both could succeed in this new environment because we love food so much. And so in terms of final takeaways, because I do want to leave a good amount of time for questions. One, a recovery is happening, but it's going to take time. Two, the pandemic, the narratives and the stories and the headlines about brands that got hit hard and are going to struggle because of the pandemic. But there are also a really significant number of brands that are going to do incredibly well post and might even be saved by the pandemic. And then finally, there's going to be opportunities, and those opportunities are going to define the winners and losers of the next, you know, few years, definitely, but probably the next few decades. Because some brand is going to look at this situation and say, here's a unique opportunity where retailers are struggling and, 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 uh, and 
you know, shopping center owners are looking for great tenants, this is our chance to expand and to do it effectively. And so who is, who is that going to be? Anyone's guess at the moment, but I would watch this, this space closely over the next few months because you're going to see the indications of moves from brands that are going to define the next decade. And that is, that's what we have. So I'd be happy to, you know, discuss this further, take any questions, well, that was great. comments. I mean, you know, just a couple of observations. One on the supermarket slide, uh, everybody was down except for Lidl. And for those uh, familiar or not familiar with Lidl, Lidl is a German owned uh, supermarket chain that's launching in the United States. And the reason why their numbers are up year over year is they didn't have a last year. So uh, they, they got a head start there uh, with that. Uh, the other yeah. thing, uh, you mentioned that, um, you know, uh, uh, I talked about Walmart for a second. And I read today that uh, Shopify is launching a new partnership with Walmart where the people who are on the Shopify platform, and for those of you who don't know, Shopify is a uh, platform for small retailers. Uh, you know, some you could even be doing it out of your, your living room during the pandemic. And rather than partnering with Amazon, uh, Shopify is uh, marrying itself to Walmart here. So that, uh, that'll that give them some point of differentiation with um, with with uh, Amazon and you know, maybe a competitive advantage. And then the last thing I want to say is that I'm glad that Placer AI wasn't around 40 years ago because the summer that I turned 17, my summer job was in the uh, working for a supermarket chain called Pathmark. And my job was going to the stores three days a week. And while customers were waiting at the cash register, I would give them a survey. Uh, and you know, part of the information was, you know, where else did they shop? Uh, where, you know, what was an intersection near where they lived? Uh, and you know, some demographic, other demographic information. So I would have been out of a job because this is way more comprehensive and accurate. Uh, so uh, thank you for not you know, starting this 40 years ago. Um, <laughs> I, I, I wish we could take the credit for it. I think it's I think it's the lack of mobile devices forty years ago. <laughs> we do have uh, some questions piling in. Uh, Samantha Brown, who is a writer for Prop Moto, uh, wants to know: Do you include curbside pickup in foot traffic for grocers? This has been huge. So I'm curious if the data show includes that. Okay, so I want to I want to do two things with this question. First, I'll answer it, and then I'll add a really important point, um, at least you know, from my perspective. So one, curbside, any visit that lasts longer than about five to seven minutes, we count as a visit. What we don't want to count is, you know, I walked in front of a Target, spoke to my mom for, for a minute and a half, and then continued walking, and count that as, as a visit, because it's, it's not one. Um, so in this analysis that you're seeing, it would include any visit above that threshold. We can do, for, it's just, it's a, it's a feature that is still in beta, but we're rolling it out fairly rapidly. We can do short visits. So imagine, you know, like a Starbucks drive through that process could take three minutes and you could be in and out. Uh, we have the ability to measure that as well, um, but only in those specific locations, it just requires us uh, handling the polygon slightly differently. Um, but what I do want to ch not challenge, but uh, analyze the full perspective of is this idea that, you know, curbside pickup and online ordering are this massive sea change in the world of, of grocery, because I don't, I don't think they are. And in fact, I think if you, if you look at online data, so we did a webinar with, with similar web, the company I used to work for, an amazing company in terms of digital intelligence, um, of curbs of uh, visits to grocery websites over the course of the pandemic. And what they found was that after about a week or two into the pandemic, visits rose dramatically, but then they very quickly returned to a much lower level. And by dramatic, I mean like 500, 600%. And then they would return over time to about 50%. And when you think that the overall 
uh, piece that online grocery takes up was about two to four percent, depending on who you whose estimates you trust. Six hundred percent is a massive jump. Fifty percent is nice, but it's still you're talking about you know three percent to six percent of visits. So that it's the overwhelming majority in this sector is still happening offline. And I think that while there was definitely a surge and an excitement around uh, online ordering in the grocery space, it um, it's likely going to take a lot longer until that becomes a more substantial element of the mix. Though again, for, if that sector doubles, a lot of companies are going to see a huge benefit from. It. Yeah, and, and you know, with the deliveries, you know, my wife went on to. Uh order groceries for her parents who are coming back from Florida. And it was like a five day, you know, you had to order like five days ahead. Um, so that's not all that convenient for most people. If you need, you know, a quarter milk today, uh, ordering it today for five days from now isn't really going to be all that helpful. Uh, so you know, I think to the, in, you know, unless they solve, the timing and last mile issues, uh, you know, people are still going to go to the grocery store as fraught with anxiety uh, as it might be during the pandemic. And it's still going to happen. I, I think you're absolutely right. I also think there's something, there's another interesting component of what do the grocers want us to do? In the sense that one of the interesting factors that was brought up by, I think it was Erin Lash at Morningstar, she brought it up on a, on a webinar we did together. Um, was that middle of the grocery, those middle aisles shopping increased dramatically. So that one of the trends that grocers had been trying to deal with was people shopping around the edges, getting the things, the, the big ticket items, and then getting out of there. But now people are willing to dedicate extra time in the grocer, and so they're gonna go aisle by aisle, and that increases their ability to, to drive purchases. And so there's also this, always gonna be this question of, what are people really showing us? And I think what we saw was that in many cases, the, the need for curbside pickup or online ordering is critical. It has to be there. It's so important. But it's, is it going to be the main thrust of grocery for the near future? Certainly not. But the other thing with people shopping in the middle of the store, too, is that many stores have adopted, for safety reasons, one-way aisles. So uh, absolutely. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. And Stu Leonard has been doing this for decades. Uh, so you know, I think people feel compelled to go down, up, up and down every aisle because it's much more difficult to just sort of cut into an aisle <laughs> than it used to be. So I think that's probably that's a very good point. Uh, so interesting. We have a question from Katie Welsh. Uh, and she, Katie wants to know, uh, am I reading this correct? Grocery stores had reduced sales year over year, or is this just the visits? Just visits. Just visits. Okay. Just visits. Now, it clearly correlates with sales in the, in the, and it's, but the correlation shift. So in a normal situation, this would be incredibly alarming. But in, an, in a time when we know that basket size has increased, it clearly needs to be read with a different lens. Yeah, uh, I think that is good. Uh, Samantha Brown, once again from PropMoto asks, what commonalities are you seeing at the brand level or center level in terms of factors that are speeding up the recovery process? Are there any specific products, locations, property types, et cetera, that seem to be ahead of the pack aside from the ones you already mentioned? Um, look, outdoor centers are outperforming indoor centers. I mean, that's not, or, you know, malls, like, that's not incredibly shocking. We don't expect that to change so sharply in the near future. Um, you know, and overall brands that have an orientation towards major cities as opposed to more rural areas or suburban areas are getting hit hard. Um, you know, again, a Whole Foods or even a Lululemon fit the bill there. You know, they're, it's not that this brand is all of a sudden terrible. It's that a lot of its audience is gone. You know, you think if you're, if you're a New York City, Whole Foods, downtown, what does it mean for you that NYU isn't there 
And what does it mean for you that other colleges of students have gone home or that people have fled their apartments for the for the basements of their parents' homes? Or, you know, it's you know, I it's 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 funny, but there are how many of the conversations, the Zoom calls that you have are someone saying, Oh yeah, this is it. I'm at my parents' house or my uncle's house or my aunt's, you know, place. And it's a lot of this escape from the city because we want a little bit of room. So that's obviously that obviously has a big impact. In terms of sectors that are benefiting, I think it's ones that hit on value and they hit on context. So, you know, do it yourself is a perfect example of context fitting really well right now. Off price, dollar stores, these are elements that really hit on value. And, uh, you know, even, you know, Walmart, the idea that I can get all of my shopping done in one place, in theory, is a really compelling offering in a time of social distancing. So these are the elements that I think are defining uh, of success on the whole, though there are obviously outlier brands. Yeah. I think furniture, uh, have you seen any data on furniture? My understanding is that uh, that sector did okay because people are spending more time at home, so they want home to be nicer. Yeah, I mean, we're, see we're definitely seeing that. Seeing at home with a big surge, obviously Pier 1 with a big surge, um, and it's it's not dissipating too much. Like it's it's contain it's it's continuing into you know into June, pretty deep into June. So how long that sustains itself for will be a big question. But yeah, it's it's a really interesting sector. Is it going to be big enough to uh, help Pier One stave off you know, liquidation? Do you think? I mean, no, because I think I mean I think at this stage it's it's over. But I think someone else is going to fill that void. So when you look at a company like do you feel, does it make you feel better about a Bed Bath & Beyond? Does it make you feel even better about an at-home or a home goods? You know, these are companies that I think could see strength on the back of some of these closures. So I know today's, you know, the focus was on retail, um, but how is the placer data helpful in other commercial real estate sectors in Europe? experience so give me give me an example of a sector and then we can kind of take that one specifically if i'm a office broker or owner uh what should i be looking for in placer data to convince a prospective tenant to pick my location so i think what you're trying to do from an office perspective it depends on the caliber of the tenant and, and what they're trying to accomplish. But we've seen a use case where they were trying to grab a significant element. There was a, a really big company, a uh, high-tech company that was looking to expand their offices. And one, of, one company came in and made a really compelling case of, don't expand it exactly an area you're in. Expand it where we are, because we can show you that a large por portion of your workforce is commuting. Are in a large portion of your competitors' workforce here, they have this campus here, is also commuting. And that can give you the ability to make this compelling offer of you can still work in an amazing tech company and still and live much closer and not work as far away from home. Um, elements of how, uh, how residential areas are growing around a certain place. Like to know if I have the right, uh, if, I see, if I see that there is a new uh, work area that has, a, that is surging in terms of people going there, it might tell me that this is a great place to put residential, you know? So there's a, a myriad of use cases. Our core focus has been on the, on the retail real estate side since we've launched, but that's primarily been, we've been guided by our customers. Um, though the, there are, we do have, you know, some really sophisticated users using this for office and for residential as well. Really interesting. Um, and with every, conversation with a prospect and, um, and do you have to you know make it clear that you're not you know doing any face identification or is, you know that the data is completely anonymous there's no way to tie it to an individual yeah yeah absolutely i mean that's the only way to be compliant in this in this kind of day and age um, it's also it's kind of, the proof is also in the pudding. Like the only product we have, is, especially when you show it to someone, the only product we have looks at anonymous aggregate data. So we're not 
looking at individuals. You can't see individuals. We're not doing advertising. We're not trying to, you know, there's, uh, we, we tell a lot of people there's, there's questions you kind of want to ask is what is it, what is a company ingesting? What are they showing and what are they making money off of? We're only ingesting anonymized data. We're only showing anonymous aggregate data. We only make our, our money. Our business is built around anonymous aggregate data. So if there's, you know, if there's a company that's selling an advertising platform and they want to know that David loves Starbucks and he also loves Target. And so when you walk past the, tar, uh, the Starbucks, they're like, hey, guess what's only $2 today instead of three fifty dollars yesterday, your favorite coffee. That's a, that requires individual information. For, what, for our purposes, we just need to have a large enough panel that's representative. Got it. I understand. Uh, another question has come in while we've been talking, and this is, uh, I know you did an apparel deep dive earlier today. What can you tell us about the trends or niche markets within apparel? Uh, well, see, people people are, I hope you, this is the second, I hope you, you, you were there for all of it, and you're just getting sick of Ethan today. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, have, I have a few sectors in apparel that I'm really excited about. And I, I'll choose the ones that I'm excited about that people have told me I'm too excited about because, you know, if we're going to be bold, let's be bold. I think plus size retail is the most exciting space. I think it's a growing market. I think it's a market that's been incredibly underserved. I think uh, there is an, a need for, for, for great brands on that side. And there's a lot of interest and intrigue around it because, you know, a company like Asina, which is in, in bankruptcy talks, Part of the conversation is, should we sell off brands like Lane, Bryant, or Catherine's? So um, you were seeing strong rebounds for them. And I think they're a really exciting space to, to keep an eye on. Um, another sector that I, a niche sector that I, that I love is the athleisure, athletic wear space. So obviously Nike, Under Armour, uh, Lululemon, really fascinating brands. And not just, I, I love them, you know, because they're, they're, so interesting to watch and they have such strong brand affinity but also because i think their success will have massive ripple effects so when you think of you know nike's success with their own retail presence puma just launched their own retail presence late last year uh levi is obviously not a sneaker brand but still talked about wholesale being a diminishing part of their of their sales and ending up focusing more on retail with plans to open a hundred more stores so this idea of product oriented brands really owning their offline retail presence to me is as exciting of a trend as there is in, in retail real estate yeah. um wow that's great uh folks anybody else have questions i know you're an inquisitive bunch uh out there uh while you're cooking up your questions i do have to take care of a little business here one is uh to thank our wonderful sponsor the news funnel the news funnel is a wonderful resource for the commercial real estate industry they aggregate uh, hundreds of different news sites and for commercial real estate and bring you the most important stuff every day you can get it emailed to you you can go visit on your on their website and you can also have it served to your own website, which is a great way to get uh, customers to visit your site regularly if they know that you're a good resource for what's going on. So please do that. Uh, I, Julia, if you could uh, put the link to the webinar schedule in the chat for future webinars, that would be wonderful. Uh, and I want to, of course, thank Julia from our team who really helps put these webinars together for us. And uh, it's a lot of work and she does a great job. So thank you, Julia. And of course, I want to thank uh, all you wonderful people who are uh, watching this with us today. Um, uh, you know, our time is our stock and trade in the real estate business. And uh, that you've given us some of that is really very valuable. To us we do have another question uh, what about data on car dealerships i know this is a bit different than retail stores but i know some people who depended on uber and public transportation are realizing these options are not feasible for the near future uh, i believe you can buy or lease a car without having to physically go to the dealership though 
Uh, have you seen any data? Of so, you know what? We haven't looked into it, but this is the second person who's brought this up in the last few days. So I don't have anything smart to say to you, except to say that I think it's a really interesting yeah. area to focus on. Yeah. Um, one that we hope to do in the very, in the, you know, in the very near future. Yeah, my, my brother just did this. So, um, and I know multiple people who I think were planning on getting a car at some point and then have kind of been putting it off, but kind of like the home improvement thing, you know, this is just sort of forced people into certain types of purchases. And obviously a car is a bigger purchase than buying some stuff for your lawn, but still uh, I've heard, I've heard around a bit about it. <laughs> And you know, it's funny, like, I, you know, I live in the suburbs, I have a car, I don't generally, you know, use Uber or Lyft. And my daughter, uh, one of my daughters is up in uh, Providence for the summer working for one of her professors and her computer broke and the Apple store is one of the stores that's uh, still closed. And she, you know, there's a Staples like, you know, a couple of miles away from her. And Best Buy is, you know, half an hour away. And without thinking, I said, well, you know, just take a Uber to wherever. And she's like, Dad, pandemic. So, <laughs> you know, I, I got a little school that's like, oh, yeah, yeah, pandemic. You don't want to get in the car that, you know, God only knows uh, who else has been in and, uh, you know, what might happen there. So, uh, yeah, I, I really understand that. Um, uh so uh, let's see. Katie Walsh uh, says that uh, inquiring minds love this information, and thank you. And Sam Brown uh, it says Vroom, V R O O M, is a used car app that had some really big growth recently. Not sure if it will sustain, but that's interesting. Uh, thank you. I haven't heard of Vroom. Uh, Julia has posted our webinar schedule in. Uh, there, but uh, before I read out the uh, upcoming webinars, uh, from Daniel Chang, he says, thank you for your great presentation. A follow-up question on this car dealership is, how do you think of the stores related with the auto industry, like advanced auto parts, auto repair shops, quick lubes, et cetera? Are you seeing uh, anything there? So the, we did an analysis a little while ago on, on tire locations um, for, for uh, for a partner, for a piece for the BCG, a Boston Consulting Group was putting together. And we found that there was a real significant drop off. You know, if you're driving your car less, the chances are that you're gonna need to go in to get you know, your tires uh, changed is drops off dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. It also aligns with what you were, you know, hearing about gas consumption or even, you know, convenience stores that are attached to gas stations saw really significant declines. Um, so every indication is that things surrounding the auto space, the owned car especially, uh, tailed off quite dramatically. Yeah. And also, I think a lot of uh, states have uh, kind of loosened up on their inspection deadlines and everything, considering the difficulties to schedule things right now. So I would imagine people feel a little less pressure to fix things that need to be fixed. Yeah, good point, Julia. Uh, the... Um... Uh, I just lost my train of thought, but that, uh, that's true. Um, all right. Well, hopefully the train will pull back into the station. But in the meantime, let me uh, tell you about uh, what we've got coming up. Uh, next week, we have Eva Baska from our syndication partner, Buildout, uh, who will be talking about Buildout's new brokerage tools. Uh, July 1st, we've got office dealmaking from home with Grittig. Uh, with Dan Mihalovic, who's the founder. July 8th, loan workouts and approaching lenders for debt relief. Plus, there'll be a rehearsal for singing Happy Birthday to Me on the 9th. Uh, <laughs> for, uh, July 15th, presenting as your best self using acting techniques. This is a really uh, new one uh, for us. Allison Monahan McGuire, who had previously uh, had a app called Walk, which gave uh, sort of location, uh, gave routes for uh, walking through cities or towns uh, based on landmarks rather than, you know, turn left at 
Streetwire Z. Uh, anyway, she has got a really uh, neat new uh, business where she's helping folks like you and me improve the way that we present with uh, acting skills. So if it could get me to stop saying um all the time, uh, sign me up. Uh, then the aforementioned news funnel will be with us on July 22nd. And Sam Brown, who is uh, with us today um, from Prop Moto, uh, will be talking to us on July 29th. Uh, I, don't, I do see that uh, Pradeep Reddy, who is one of our partners, uh, is watching live today. Pradeep's uh, got a company called Land Checks, and this is uh, a great thing if you are sort of stuck uh, at home and need to do due diligence on properties that you are representing or uh, their technology land checks does virtual due diligence and it's really powerful they pull hundreds of different databases so it's a really great info for you commercial real estate professionals out there uh, Ethan uh, you're in Israel right now, correct? Yes, sir. And what time is it there? It is 10.53. 10.53, okay. Well, we better let you uh, get ready for bed now. So uh, thank you so much. This was so illuminating. Uh, could you just share one more time your contact information with the viewers? Sure, sure. So my, my email is uh, ethan at placer.ai, and you can Kind of check us out and see what we do in our free tools at placer.ai but i just wanted to thank you david so much for having me and julia so much for your help it was really you know just a kind of a joy to get to do this and, and such a privilege working on it together well, thank you and hopefully we can get you uh back in a few months because you know we're in a very fluid dynamic uh, situation and uh, this data is all going to be changing uh <laughs> you know, day by day, if not minute by minute. So uh, we'd love to get an update from you in a few months. So we'll- uh, We're looking forward to it. Excellent. Uh, thank you everybody again for your time and we'll hopefully see you on future webinars. Uh, tell you what, if you have joined Quantum Listing already or you uh, haven't joined and you join, uh, send us an email at uh, david at quantum listing and uh, we'll figure some way to give you something to thank you uh, for your time, whether it's boosting your listings or maybe doing brand promotion or something like that. Uh, we'd love to do something for you. So you've been a lovely audience and we'll see you next time. Thank you.